So um, I was just remembering that a conversation, actually maybe maybe the first like real conversation I had with Tom, just himself and I, and we were at this, in the sanctuary of the church that um, we used to go to together. And um, I don't know, we were talking about teaching and maybe you were going to, I don't know what the context was. It was teaching in church. And, and he looked at me and he said, are you a teacher? And I said, no. And he said, yes, you are. He said, yes, you are. And, uh, and I said, I've never taught before, not even kids. Like I always did nursery, like babies. So, um, so yeah. And, and God just said, you know, someday you're going to teach and, and wait till Tom asks you to teach. That was six years ago. <laughs> so I've just been waiting until Tom said, asked me to teach. So, um, we have history. All right. So um, I'm just going to pray for myself really quick. So God, um, Lord, I'm just praying that I would hear clearly what you're saying. Um, I have my notes, but Lord, I just pray that you would help me to serve my brothers and sisters by um, just hearing what you're saying, Lord, in Jesus' name. So um, I heard this all, this message kind of all came from a bunch of different things, and it didn't feel like they were all going together. And then as I went on, it did. Um, I, I heard a Mike Beck Bickle message um, I had downloaded on my phone like a year ago and then never had listened to it. And then recently um, in the car um, when we were we were living out in Dalton, and that's a drive, so you get some time to listen to some things in your car. And so um, listening to this Mike Bickle message about David and, and his heart, um, you know, the revelation that David had about God's heart. And um, it was just very, very helpful. And the Lord really used that. I actually listened to it a few times, which I don't normally do, um, to really work into my heart about um, this idea that um, it's it's the trajectory of our heart. Like the bend is what God is after and not the, the perfection in it. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing that I've really learned, I think, in the last two years of... Um, especially being here, at, at, you know, after we um, formed this house of prayer was um, just this idea that, you know, we've got the flesh and we've got the spirit and, and, and the whole point is to just keep saying yes to the spirit and, and crucifying our flesh and to keep um, just on a path that is just desiring and participating with God in crucifying our flesh and saying yes to the spirit, right? Um, and um, I am going to stop for one second because I'm going to really wish that I had two stands. Well, my Bible's really big. <laughs> Gabriel's music is all over the floor. So um, really quickly in Romans 8, and I... Did you guys learn a song about the books of the Bible besides Sam Stoltz? <laughs> Romans 8, um, verses 5 through 8. I didn't print all this off. Um, okay, for those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are living according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded, that means if your flesh is controlling your mind, it's death and death stinks. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is emmed in need with God, um, for it's not subject to the law of God, nor can it, can it be. And, you know, I was laying in bed last night, and I was just thinking about other religions. And um, thank you, Jesus, that we have something to do with our flesh, right? We crucify it. And then it goes on to say, like, he's amazing. He makes it all come full circle. We learn to live according to the Spirit and follow the Holy Spirit. And he even, like, redeems our flesh on top of it. But you can see in other religions, it's like, this duality of, of knowing like I'm supposed to live with some kind of spirituality, but I don't know what to do with my flesh. And so they kind of like stir their flesh into their spirituality and like weird stuff happens, especially like sexually, like weird stuff in other religions, you know? Like I think you think of Islam, it's like, well, you're gonna someday like what, go to paradise and there's gonna be a bunch of virgins. That's weird, right? And and so because they don't have anything to do with it because they don't have Jesus. Jesus is what to do with our flesh. And so I, I don't know. That was like a side note. I was just thinking about that last night. Like, for lots of weird stuff in other religions. And lukewarm living, right, in Revelation 3, it says, you're not hot, you're not cold. I really wish you were one or the other. Um, being lukewarm, it just, 
it's gross to me. I want to spit you out of my mouth. And I've always thought, I remember, I remember where I was when I learned about this in high school and youth group. And I remember thinking, the Bible says it. And all of my friends and my youth group leaders are like, yeah. But really inside, I was like, is it, are you serious, God, that it is better to be cold than to be like kind of warmish? Really? And and I just remember thinking that, but just being like with all my friends and being like, yeah, can't better to be cold than lukewarm. And um, one thing I learned, um, I made bread for a while. I was thinking about you last night, Dave, because um, I made bread um, for a while. And in order to activate your yeast, you need to put, you need lukewarm water with your yeast. It's not so hot that it kills it, um, but it's warm enough to activate it. And how you can tell in my sink, I would just turn my water on. And the point where I could stick my finger in the water and I couldn't feel it, I couldn't feel cold and I couldn't feel hot. That's where lukewarm is. And when you're lukewarm, you don't feel anything. And the picture the Lord gave me about this, and I think because Jess was up on the tall ladder putting the tool up, was um, I just saw a man, and he was straddling the top of a ladder. That's not the safe place to be on a ladder. <laughs> don't ever do that. But it's like, it's like this great feeling of like I've got one leg um, in the spirit, and it feels really good because we want – mankind, we want spirituality, right? We want to feel like we're close with God um, and we're okay with him. We really want to be okay with him. And then the other leg in, in the flesh that's like, it's still like making happy my flesh and like all of the desires of my flesh. So, and, and that's where lukewarm is, where you're trying to keep a leg on both sides, like enough God to like feel really good about that part of your life, and then enough flesh to be like, I can still hold on to all of this. And, and, and it's like we're always trying to prove to ourselves it's like a lie that we have to give up our flesh. We can keep it. Look at how I'm doing this. I'm balanced. Look at me. I'm a pie, and I've got a leg on both sides, and I'm making it all work. And I still get to hold on to my flesh, and I still get, you know, like I'm not doing drugs. <laughs> There are more things than drugs. That's when I was in high school. I thought if you are not like, if you're not doing drugs and partying and, and having sex, that was the flesh. Like that was what that meant to me. Like that was the flesh. I'm like, okay, there's a little bit more to that. Um, there, just a little bit more. Um, so lukewarm is this. And um, and so I was I was just thinking about David and and um in the, in, the, in the house of prayer. And, you know, we come to this place, the house of prayer is meant to be a threshing floor. And I'm sure you guys probably all know this, but I'll just say it. Um, a threshing floor would be built on top of a hill, right? Hills are windier and that's important. So up on a hill and you would, um, a big, um, you'd pave like a big circle and then you would take all of your grain and dump it in the middle and have um, probably some oxen with something heavy, like usually another stone, and it would crunch it all up because inside of wheat there is the good part, and then there's all the extra. They call it the chaff. That's the stuff you don't want. You don't want to grind that up. It's not going to taste delicious. It's not good for you. So you have to get rid of all of that, and so it's this process of getting rid of it, and then there's like the forks to help. You know, you're basically just crunch it all up and then start throwing it in the air, and everything that's Good is going to fall down, and everything that's not is going to blow away. And and so, um, you know, David, he built the house of prayer on a threshing floor. And um, he actually had two threshing floor experiences. Um, and David, this is why we love David, because he's such a screw-up. He's such a mess, it, like a big mess, not in little ways. I mean, I don't even mess up as bad as he does. And, and yet, he manages to, like, he wins with God. And it's, it's so encouraging. You read it, and you're like, you're a mess. But you're still okay with God. Like, there's hope for me. I can, we could do this, right? Because you were, you were something, and you still. But, but the Bible says you're a man after, um, you were after God's heart. He was pleased with you. Like you read all the Psalms and you're like, how, how did this happen? How did this guy screw up so bad and still be okay with the Lord? Um, and so uh, let's see. Sorry, I got to look at my notes. Yeah, so the, the house of prayer is the threshing floor where we come and we willingly lay ourselves down. We say, God, crunch us up, throw us in the air. What of us is going to fall back down to the ground and wanting it to blow away? Um, 
And that's how we get. He tosses us in the air. And we get sanctified. We get more of our flesh flies away. And spirit leadership is what we get out of that, the good fruit, right? And I was just thinking last night, isn't that what it, like, that's childlikeness, right? That, uh, like, dads throw their kids up in the air, you know? When I'm being tested and sanctified, I never feel like that. But that's, like, I was just thinking about that last night. Like, oh, wow, we just, like, like a dad throwing us in the air um, because it's really good for us. Um, let's see. So David has two of these that I want to talk about. I'm going to be in First Chronicles. But he's corrected. Actually, the Lord sifts him as a priest and as a king. Um, let's see. So the, well, let's see. Oh, the point of sanctification was, is not perfection. And I probably will say that like three times. It's not perfection. Because if that were true, the 11th hour worker would never get paid as much as, as the guy, you know, I just think of like this, this story I'm going to tell in, in how much David messes up. And then his wife, all she does is get really annoyed and embarrassed by him and tell him that like such a little thing. She's barren for the rest of her life. You know what I mean? And it just, it feels so unfair that David can do this really big screw up. She does something little and, and David comes back and he's fine with the Lord. And she's just never, she's never the same. Um, it's, it's about our heart, right? Um, let's see. We all know inside of our hearts. I think if we really look, um, if we let our spirit shine a light inside of us and look at us, we know whether our trajectory is for the Lord. If our bend, our tendency is to be obedient to him, to follow him, to love and adore him, or if it's not. Um, okay, so I'm going to go to First Chronicles 13. Oh, I put a, I actually did kind of put a thing in here. All right, that's where we'll be most of the time. So David, um, in this story, he's fought some fights. He's always fighting. And, you know, big victory. So him and all of his army buddies, they're having um, a great time. They're hanging out. They're eating. Um, they're celebrating. And David gets this idea. And he's like, let's go get the ark and let's bring it here. Um, and he looks at his, his dudes, his guys, and he's like, you want to do it? And they're like, let's do it. All the people um, think this is a great idea. Let's go do it. Um, So they, they go do it, and, and they do it in their own way. This isn't, um, when I was picturing this, and I'm always like, okay, Lord, that just, it's, it's the distant past, you know, uh, what does this look like here? And God just gave me this picture of a huge sanctuary in this, this church meeting where all the, do, you know, all the, all the friends, they all just looked at each other and were like, let's do it. We're going to go, and we're going to apprehend the Lord. And, and, and all the friends are like, yes, let's do it. And you've got all of this going on and all the people out there, and they're partying. So just imagine that, right? So they're like, we're going to go get it, and they build a cart. So David, I'm in verse 5, he gathered all of Israel together and from Shihor to, in Egypt to as far as the entrance of Hamath to bring the Ark of the Lord from kirjath Jerem. And David and all Israel went up to, oh, there's so many names, blah, to kirjath Jerem, uh, which belonged to Judah. And he brought up from there the Ark of God of the Lord who dwells between the cherubim where his name is proclaimed. So they carried the Ark of God in a new cart with um, from the house of Abinadad, and Yuza and Ahio drove the cart. Then David and all Israel played music before the Lord with all their might, with singing on harps and stringed instruments, on tambourines and cymbals with trumpets. Can you guys see it? Like a parade. In the new cart, they probably found like the trustiest dudes to do all the driving, probably like the most experienced oxen, you know, that are going to be... You know, they just, they did the best that they could and they thought in their imaginings, this is, this is how this should go. Um, and when they came to, I'm in verse nine, and when they came to Ch um, Chidon's threshing floor, Yuza put out his hand to hold the ark and the oxen stumbled. Then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah and he struck him because he had put his hand on the ark and he died there before the Lord. What the heck? <laughs> this ain't fair. Um, he didn't do anything wrong, right? Like, why? I, and I just imagine, like, this huge party, and the Lord comes and unplugs, like, the power. All the, all the lights go off, all the music stops, and, like, you know, the drummer falls over dead. And you were like, we, we were partying, God. This was all for you. We came to get you. And, and God was just like, 
no, this is not the way that I asked you to do this. He died there before the Lord. And David, he got angry because of the Lord's outbreak, even the language. Like, I'm so mad at you, the outbreak against Uzzah and the um, Kidon, that were the, the man who owned the threshing floor, his name means javelin. And that's what this experience was like. Like, you know, everything's going fine. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, <laughs> kills this guy, his friend. And um, uh, Uzzah dies on Kidon's searching floor. Let's see. Oh, and they name it Perez. They call it later Perez. Uzzah outburst against Uzzah. So it's like all this feeling of like, what in the world did God just do? Like, I think David's really shocked. Did not see this coming. I, I feel like you can just see like this was not um, anything he ever thought was going to happen. Um, so David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak, outbreak against Uzzah. Therefore, the place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day, saying, how can I bring the ark of God to me? So David leaves this whole experience, and he's scared of God. And he's really mad at him. And probably, I would imagine, like, really embarrassed. Wouldn't you be embarrassed if you had gotten everybody to come? And it was, all, I mean, just like, you're the church leader. And we're going, because this is David, and he's being, he's, he's being a priest. He's leading the church to come on, let's go and regate the Lord. And the God just like, he sweeps the rug out from under him and it costs the life of his friend. And I think in the Old Testament, it's really easy to skim over that, like people dying. And it feels like, like people are dying all the time because they are, but it's like somebody died because of this. What a mistake. David was afraid of God that day, and he said, how can I bring the ark of God to me? So David would not move the ark with him into the city of David, and he took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The, the ark of God remained with the family of Odin, Odin Edom, Oben Edom, in his house three months, and the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. Um, David was corrected at this threshing floor, like like a javelin because of how he was acting like a priest. And, and God didn't correct him because he didn't want him to, to be a priest. He corrected him because he wanted it, him to do it rightly. Um, he just wanted it done right. And God cares about, about the details. I was reading in, it's in Hebrews, like the list of like the faith, um, like the forefathers, is that Hebrews 11, the forefathers and their faith. And like the first one, it says, um, I want to find it. Hold on. Let me put that here. I want to find it. It's in Hebrews. It's in Hebrews. I'm not going to be able to find it, am I? Sorry, guys. It's a Cain and Abel. The Abel's. Abel was, um, the Abel was faithful. I really want to find that. Hebrews 11, 4. Thank you. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. He didn't even like do, I mean, Cain brought stuff too. He didn't, he was just obedient. That faith looks like obedience. And I never think that. I think that faith is like a dream, um, you know, a wish that your heart makes, like <laughs> the Disney song. Like, your faith is like the magic pixie dust that you sprinkle on your heart so you can believe things will happen that are going to be good. But um, this is saying that Abel, um, it was his faith that made him obedient, that faith looks like obedience in doing things. God cares about the way that we do things. And so um, I'm just praying for us. I actually, um, I, I felt like I was supposed to say all that, and then I wasn't, like, sure about how this was applying to us. But, God, that we, um, as we act as priests, God, that we would care about how you're asking us to do things. Um, David, um, what David needed to do, he needed to go ask the priests, Right? That would have, it would have, somebody's life would have been spared. Everything would have been fine because that's what he ends up doing. He just asks the priest and, oh, okay, we do it and it all works. So surprised. And, um, and so we don't, 
you know, God doesn't give us priests that we need to go ask all this stuff of, but he gives us Jesus. Jesus is our great high priest, right? And so we need to constantly be going back to him and saying, um, you know, whether it's church life, whether it's how we're leading um, our family as priests or our, our friends at work, or, you know, we're leaders, we are priests, and we're leading people um, to God, to experience God. And that's what David wanted. He wanted to be closer to the Lord. Like bringing the ark was, I want to be closer to the Lord. And I want, um, I want all my friends to be closer to the Lord. That's why he called everybody together. He didn't go get it by himself. He's like, let's go do this. So they all go do it. And, and God, um, he, he corrects David. And in Psalm, I'm going to go to Psalm 19, verses 7. And so I just, I, I'm just imagining him at this place where he's trying to do what he thought was really right. He's shocked <laughs> that God would javelin throw at him right in the heart and embarrass him in front of all of his friends, all of his war buddies, right? There's nobody you want to be embarrassed in front of quite like your war buddies. And, and, um, and so David's like, well, I can't do this here. I'm just sitting it here. And he recovers quickly, right? And, um, you said that about me, and I think that that is something that the Lord would tell all of us is to be quick to recover and to come back to him. So like three months later, I feel like I would need a little more time. I'd need like a year or two <laughs> to, be, to, to stop being angry at God for, for freaking out on me. Um, but this is, David wrote this psalm, um, Psalm 19.7. It says, the law of the Lord is perfect. It's converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. He's making wise and simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart, and the commandment of the Lord is pure. It's enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. It's enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, much than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned and kept from there is and in keeping them, there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from secret fault and keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then I shall be blameless and I shall be innocent of great transgressions. And that was that was his problem. And that was, it was a huge presumptuous sin. He presumed he knew, like, I'm, I'm buddy a buddy enough with God to know. Um, and, and, you know, we're walking together, we're doing things. He's, you know, of course he wants me to do this. And, um, it was just really, it was arrogant and it was presumptuous for him to do that. Um, but I love, I love that he comes back. And so I just, I, who knows if this is true. I'll ask him someday, but I just imagine he wrote all of this and he's thinking about that time, that time when the Lord really corrected him, um, on that threshing floor in front of all of his friends, a, a dude died and the God, God is, and, and David comes back and he's like the law of the Lord it's converting my soul. This is my testimony from that, that the testimony of the Lord, uh, it's sure, and it's making me wise. I'm really simple. I'm not that smart, and it's making me wise. I'm knowing what to do. The statutes of the Lord, they're making my heart rejoice in them, and the commandment of the Lord, it's not, it's not stupid and arbitrary, the way he said to bring that ark back. It's pure. It's enlightening my eyes. I'm starting to see more clear because I'm listening to what he's saying. And the fear, he was afraid that day. But he's saying, that fear, that's clean. It's always going to last. I'm always going to have the fear of the Lord. And it's clean to me. It's, it's making me clean. And his judgments that day when he judged me, it was true. And it was altogether righteous. This isn't how my heart responds <laughs> to the Lord correcting me. Sometimes I get a little bit of that. But I just think... David, and this is why David wanted, he wanted to be close to the Lord and he just, he knew the Lord's heart. He was, he wanted to know the Lord's heart. Um, and so I just think in this, um, the opposite of that, that lukewarm living, um, where, you know, you've got like that one foot on that ladder in your flesh, um, a lot of times it's pride, it's arrogance, it's that presumptuous sin, you know, where I'm like, David's, you know, you could see him straddling. I'm close to the Lord and he tells me things and I can go to battle and I'll be like, Lord, should we do it? And he'll be like, yeah, go do it. And we do it and we win. And, you know, I'm good with him. And then the, and then the flesh comes in and the spirit part was true. Like he was close to the Lord, but the, the flesh came in and it got him into trouble because it, it was all this presumptuous stuff coming up. All right. So 
Oh, yeah. Matthew 7, where, um, you know, Jesus, he's saying, like, you can do all of these things for me. You can, you can, and, and I feel like it's so important for us, and I feel like it's weird that the church doesn't talk enough about that verse where it just says, you know, you can be doing all of these things for me because they're all stuff that we care about, especially in the charismatic church, like healing the sick and prophesying and, and all of these things, like these are kind of the things that we do. And there's, but there's this huge warning that we can, we can see him someday and he'll be like, oh, I don't know your name. Can you eat? Like, he might see Noah someday and be like, oh, I don't know you. I don't know your name. He might see Samantha someday. And, and if we, and just say like, oh, I don't know you. And she'll be like, I was in the house prayer all the time. And I was like, remember that time that I prayed for that guy and he got healed? That was me. And he'll be like, oh, yeah, I don't know. And, uh, you know, because he's after our heart. And um, so I, I felt like what the Lord was uh, over all of this saying was in the house of prayer that sanctification, becoming more like him, um, being hot and not being content with lukewarm um, is the found, that threshing floor is the foundation of the house of prayer. And if we don't, keep that as our foundation, um, it will be unsustainable. We'll have people come in and they'll be excited about praying because they really care that little boys are saved from a cave because they love people. They really care that the homeless um, are saved and they really, like a lot of good intentions, right? And, and then they'll, and then little boys will be saved from a cave <laughs> and then they'll go out the door. And because the only thing that's going to keep us here and coming here um, is ourself. And it's not a selfish thing. It's just because we live with ourselves and we're not, um, you know, Jesus is coming back for a pure and spotless bride. He's not, he didn't say, okay, look, this is what I want. Um, as soon as the earth is like 56.3% saved, then I'm going to come back. There, that wasn't his formula. He's like, I want a pure and spotless bride. And it's because wouldn't it be great though, if he were like 54.6% and then we would all be on it. We'd be like, we want Jesus. So let's figure this out. We're going to go evangelize. We're like, let's get our 56 point or whatever percent. And then it would just be done. But that's not what he asked. He asked for a pure and spotless bride, which is so frustrating because you can't make anybody else be a pure and spotless bride. You only can make yourself be a pure and spotless bride. And, um, and it doesn't happen, you know, God doesn't come up to us and say, you don't have to be afraid anymore. And then you're like, thank God, I don't have to be afraid anymore. And then you're never afraid again. <laughs> it's a process, right? And it's, it takes a long time. And so, um, yeah, that, sorry, that was kind of a tangent. But I feel like that overall is what the Lord is saying. Like, we can't um, let go as a body of knowing that the threshing floor is our foundation. And it's what is actually um, sustaining us. Um, so, okay, so back to, back at the ranch in First Chronicles. How do I get back there? Oh, I thought I put a thing. And then we flip. I'm in Second Chronicles. Okay. So, where did he leave off? Oh, so he screws up, right? They screw up. So David, chapter 14, David, he, he's headed to Jerusalem, and he's established, and then... Um, and then in, in chapter 15, David builds a house for himself in the city of David, and he prepares a place for the ark of God and pitched a tent for it. So you can see David is, um, you know, super scared and pretty angry at God because he freaked out on him. But like a couple months later, he's like, okay, so he's recovered. He's gotten a hold of himself, and he's like, well, let's do this. Then David said, no one may carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord has chosen them to carry the ark of God and minister before him forever. And David gathered all Israel together at Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the Lord from his place, which he had prepared for it. So David, smarty pants, learns, and he goes and he asks, like the priest, okay, wait, how are we supposed to do this? And guess what? It works. Yay, David. Yay. 
Why? Because God wasn't interested in being separate from him. He wanted to be with him. He just wanted it done the right way, and it mattered to God. And it's God's prerogative. You know, sometimes it's sort of that parent, like, because I said so. And sometimes it is just the Lord's prerogative to decide what he is important to him and what's not. And and us to be obedient children and not, you know, I like knowing. And I feel like there are some things in my life that I've questioned for decades decades and the Lord is finally answering. But it's that, it's that lukewarm thing. I was probably, I mean, it's probably been two decades, 16 years old. And I feel like he's just talking to me that about that right now, but in faith and obedience, you just believe being lukewarm is worse than being cold. I don't, you know, and you just keep going. Um, and so we, I want more information, but I have to be an obedient child and not need it. Um, and then it's his, you know, I just stay in conversation with him and it's his choice to keep telling me things, you know, when he's going to tell them to me. And he always does at the right time. Um, let's see. Oh, this is great. So he gets the arc there and then, um, yeah, so that works out. And then look at all of like verse or chapter 16. It's all this really long David's song of Thanksgiving. And he's just like, He's really come back, you know, with a swing. The like scared and angry, but now I'm back here, and he's just like, oh man. Give give to the Lord the glory due His name. Um, in verse 29, bring an offering and come up before Him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of His holiness. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for His good and His mercy it endures forever. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. Oh, that's so great. David's so happy. So um, let's see. Verse, cha- sorry, we're cruising through First Chronicles. Chapter 17. So now, like, he's all good with the Lord. And now it came to pass in chapter 17 when David was dwelling in his house that David said to Nathan the prophet, look, he's like, goes to go talk to a prophet. That's probably smart. See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of the covenant of the Lord is is under tent curtains. Then Nathan said to David, do all that's in your heart for God is with you. So he goes and he's like, you just see this guy like laying awake at night in bed and being like, oh, this ain't right. I really love the Lord. He's in a tent. That's embarrassing. We, you know, I don't want to thank God. I don't want him to hang out in a tent. Like let's build him a house. Yeah. Let's build him a house. And, you know, just imagining he's like the guy at the restaurant with the napkin and he's going to draw it out and be like, I know yeah, we could do that and we could do that. And so he's planning it and he goes to talk to Nathan because he's learned a lesson. You should probably like consult with somebody who hears from the Lord. And then Nathan's like, yeah, go do it. But then God is super merciful, right? And, and it wasn't David's fault that Nathan says, yeah, go do it. So he comes to Nathan and he says, I don't, you know, go and tell my servant, servant David, thus says the Lord, you shall not build me a house to dwell in for I have not dwelt in a house since the time that I brought up Israel, even to this day, but have gone from tent to tent and from one tabernacle to another, whatever I have moved, wherever I have moved about with all Israel, I have never spoken a word to any of the judges of Israel whom I have commanded to shepherd my people saying, why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now, therefore, thus shall you say to my servant, David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the sheepfold from following the sheep to be rule over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you've gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you and have made you a name like the name of the great men who are here on the earth. So God just like, he just goes in it. He's like, you want to build me a house? Okay, that's, you know, whatever. I didn't really want one. But hey, let me tell you about you. Let me tell you about your house. Let me tell you, like, and oh, how merciful. Like the Lord didn't need David to build him a house. And, and if he had wanted one, he would have been like, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. But it was in David's heart. You know, he just loved him. And it was, he was childlike. It was, you know, and, and, and God gave David a lot of leeway about, um, you know, eating the showbread with his guys because it just, and he wasn't supposed to do that, but it was like he was after his heart. And so he gives him a lot of leeway, but, he, um, you know, I just see the Lord being like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, let me tell you all about you. And he starts telling him about him. I took you from the sheepfold, from following the sheep to be the rule over my people, Israel. And I have been with you wherever you've gone and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I have made you a name like the name of the great men who are on the earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for for my people, Israel, and I will plant them. 
that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more as previously. He starts talking to David about everything that he cares about. He cares. David cares about Israel. He cares about those people. Since the time that I commanded um, judges to be over my people Israel, also I will subdue all your enemies. Furthermore, I will tell you that the Lord will build you a house. Like, I'm going to build you a house. I don't really need a house, but I'm going to build you a house. And it shall be when your days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up your seed after you, who will be um, of your sons. And you, like, okay, I really love all your people, so I'm going to take care of them. I love you. I'm going to build you a house. I love your kids. I mean, th those are the things, right? Like, you're his inheritance, right? His, his kids and what's going to come after. He cares about our kids. I'm going to establish your kids. He shall build me a house and I will establish, establish his throne forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son and I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him who was before him and I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever and his throne shall be established forever. It's like, whoa, this is like, look at all this sweet interaction. Like, isn't this the part that we want, right? We're going to um, just go back and forth with God where we're like pouring it out and just telling him how wonderful it is. And he comes back and he's like, I really love you too. And I'm going to, I'm going to take care of all the things that you could possibly fret about that you're responsible for. And, um, and I'm just going to take care of them and you don't have to worry about anything because you're after my heart. And just this little line down, um, in verse 18, um, David says for you, you know, your servant, he knows our hearts, right? All right, and then skipping um, in chapter 17 over to verse 25, it says, for that you will build him a house. Therefore, your servant has found in his heart to pray before you. And now, Lord, I just like, can you just imagine God being like, Tom, I totally, I'm going to establish your house. It's going to be different than what you've got right now. It's going to be bigger. And um all of the people, all your church friends that you've ever, that you love, I'm going to take care of all of them. You don't have to worry anymore. And your kids, I'm going to establish all of them, like give you a picture of where they're going to live and their families. And, and, uh, and then all of a sudden, like, wouldn't you feel like all of the weight that you're carrying from all of your responsibilities would just fall away? And you'd just be like, you're going to build me a house. Therefore, your servant has found it in his heart to pray before you. I'm just going to pour myself out for you because now I'm not worried about anything. And now, Lord, you are God and have promised this goodness to your servant. Now you have been pleased to bless the house of your servant that it may continue before you forever. For you have blessed it, O Lord, and it shall be blessed forever. Oh, man, what a, like, like is that like the deepest breath you'd ever take in your whole life? And just be like, whew, God has promised me so much. So all of this happens. It's so sweet. And then... David messes up again because <laughs> he's just a guy, right? This is all like so wonderful. And if the story ended there, wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if he had just died right there and you'd be like, oh, and da, 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 into eternity. But no, there's more room <laughs> for this dude to screw up. So, you know, David, chapter 18, 19, 20, there's like, a you know, some more conquests and stuff that he does great. Um. And then David, um, he screws up again. So tw uh, chapter 21 says, Now Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. God will use Satan to sift us. He'll, he'll use, he'll be like, yeah, go ahead. And again, the Lord is throwing us up in the air um, to see what will fall down and hopefully some things will blow away. And I will say right now, the Lord doesn't throw us in the air. We make a choice to let him throw us in the air. Um, we can be stubborn and not participate in this in the threshing floor at all. And, you know, he's coming eventually to sift the church. He's coming to sift the whole world eventually. It, but how glorious that we can participate in that right now and not wait until later. It's really foolish to wait till later. Now, Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. So David said to, oh, I like, I searched how to say his name. I can't remember it. Hoab. It was different. It was like the, it was like an H. Um, to Joab and to the leaders of the people, go and number Israel from Beersheba to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know. And Joab answered, more people should name their kid Joab because this guy's great. May the Lord make his people a hundred times more than they are. But my Lord, the king, 
are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then does my Lord require this thing? Why should he be a cause of guilt in Israel? It's really wise to surround yourself with friends who love you. And even if you're the person in power, will tell you, like, this is not smart. Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed again. He just got stubborn about this. Um, prevailed against Joab and before Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. Then Joab gave the sum of the numbers of the people to David. All Israel had 1,100,000 men who drew the sword and Judah had 470,000 men who drew the sword. But he did not count Levi and Benjamin among them for the king's word was abominable to Joab. So he kind of did it, but he kind of didn't either because, you know, Jerusalem or um, like Levi, the priest, and then Benjamin, that was the place where like the tabernacle was. Um, so he's like, I'll do this sort of, I'll sort of do it. Um, and he brings back, and it's interesting, I'm not super into numbers, but I added all those numbers up and then, um, you know, spoiler alert, 70,000 of them die, but that's like, it's about 6% and, and kind of like the typical, um, you know, Bible symbolism, six is like, the number of humanity, um, you know, like in your humanness, um, it, David, it doesn't really say why he numbered them. Um, I read somewhere that there was, as I was studying this, that there was actually, uh, you know, God did say like, you can take a census. This is the way to do it. And he didn't do it that way, but I think it wasn't that he just did it. I mean, I think this is a bigger deal than just not doing it the right way. Like a guy died when he just did something good the wrong way. But, um, you know, I just imagine like, now David had a lot of stuff. And when you've got a lot of stuff and a lot of responsibility, you have to take care of it. You know, it's really easy if you're just like poor single mom with like nothing and you've got these kids to take care of to just be like, Lord, help me. I don't, you know, I have no, I can't do anything to take care of myself. But then, you know, once you get a house and you've got some money and now you have to be responsible, you have to take care of everything. And that's what I think David was doing that. Um, he was, he had all this pressure to be responsible. Maybe like a census is like totally normal. You're supposed to, you're the king. You should go count your people. You should make some war plans. Um, you know, he got, he was nervous and it was so weird. Cause if you go back and you read about all those chapters, we just, it like the Lord delivered everybody into his hands. It was his faith. He had an issue with faith. Um, and he had, he had an issue with doubt. And so, um, his friend is trying to tell him like, don't do this. And he just did it anyway. And God was displeased with this thing. Therefore he struck Israel. So David said to God, I've sinned greatly immediately. He's like, I knew I shouldn't have done this. And he knew he shouldn't have done it because a friend told him he shouldn't, even if he didn't know it anyway. Um, I Right away, oh, I've sinned greatly because I have done this thing. But now I pray, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. Then the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, saying, go and tell David, saying, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and said to him, thus says the Lord, choose for yourself either three years of famine, three years, three months to be defeated by your foes with the sword of your enemies overtaking you or else for three days, the sword of the Lord, the plague of the land, which the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory of Israel. Now consider what answer I should take back to him who sent me. So he gave, even gave David some horrible choices. Here you go. Choose your own punishment. Have you guys ever done that with your kids? What do you want? You're going to be grounded from the TV for a week, or you're going to have to go to your grandma's and pull weeds. There you go. All this stuff. Here you go. I think it makes it worse when you have choices. And David said to Gad, I'm in great distress. Please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. So David, even when he's just done the, like, the dumbest thing ever, and um, huge repercussions, and he's like, I'll, I'll trust the Lord. I don't just get it over with. Um, so the Lord sent a plague upon Israel and 70,000 men of Israel died. You know, great, David, you want to count them? You want to know like how, how, you know, you want to start making strategies about how you're going to win the next thing. And do we have enough people to take these guys? And I don't know, maybe he wanted to expand his territory. Who really knows? But God is like, he killed 70,000 of them. And God sent an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he, was, as he was destroying, the Lord looked and relented of the disaster. And he said to the angel who was destroying, it's enough. Now restrain your hands. And the angel of the Lord, he stood by the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jebusite, another threshing floor. You know, David, this was his culture that he came from for us. We might miss it, but he's not missing it. He's, you're sifting me, Lord. 
you, you know, oh, all these people are dead. 70,000 people. I, I screw up. Like, we've all screwed up in ways that um, other people have to pay for, right? Whether it's our family, um, whether it's at work or in our churches or... I mean, I've never screwed up so bad that 70,000 people died. I can't, I can't imagine. Well, how painful would that be? Um, and, and David is, he's being sifted as a king here, right? And um, I felt like what the Lord was telling me about this was, um, you know, we're priests and we're kings. And most of us are not, I would say none of us are in governmental positions as it is, but um, the kingdom of God, the government of God is familial, like it, it, it's based in families. And so, you know, our families are typically the threshing floor where our um, our kingship, <laughs> our governmental kind of, uh, you know, destiny that we're going to walk into someday um, is very tediously um, being sifted in our families. And um, it's not very glamorous. Um, and it, but it can be like the most painful things, you know, because we're closest to these people. And David, this must have been one of the most painful things that ever happened to him. 70,000 people died. And he, he messed up. He led his people. Um, you know, I just remember back um, when, when God was telling him all those things about how he's going to establish them. He's like, I took you away from your sheep, and I brought you, and I put you here. And look what he says. David lifted up his eyes, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing between earth and heaven, having in his hand a drawn sword stretched over Jerusalem. Can you imagine seeing the, uh, just the angel of the Lord with a sword, and these are your people. So David and the elders, clothed in sackcloth, they fell on their faces, and David said to God, was it not I who commanded the people to be numbered? I am the one who has sinned and done evil indeed. But these sheep, what have they done? He's remembering, David, you were a great shepherd. You took really good care of your sheep, and we moved you on. And now he's like, I'm a crappy shepherd. This sucks. I've really messed up. They're just innocent, and I've look what I've done to them. Let your hand, I pray, O Lord, my God, be against me and my father's house, but not against your people that they should be plagued. Therefore, the angel of the Lord commanded Gad to say to David that David should go and erect an altar to the Lord on the thresh threshing floor of Ornan and the Jebusite. So David went up to, at the word of Gad, which had been spoken in the name of the Lord. Now Ornan um, turned and saw the angel and his four sons who were with him. They hid themselves, but Ornan, he continued threshing wheat. So he just kept going. I'm going to keep working. David came and um, he looks up and he sees David and he went out from the threshing floor and he bowed before David with his face to the ground. And then David said to him, grant me the place of this threshing floor that I may build an altar on it to the Lord. You shall grant it to me at the full price that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. But Ornan said to David, take it to yourself. And let my lord the king do with it what do what is good in his eyes. Look, I also give you the oxen for the burnt offerings, the threshing implements for the wood and the wheat for the grain offering. I'm going to give it all to you for free. Sweet. It's like a coupon. He's like, no. <laughs> Can you just imagine David? No. <laughs> I'm not doing anything to make God more mad. No, but I will surely buy it for the full price, for I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor burnt offerings, um, at which costs me nothing. But David's like, I'm not. I've screwed up so bad. There's no way I'm going to take this from you. No, oh, but thank you. Um, so he gave Ornan 600 shekels of gold in weight to buy the place, and David built there an altar to the Lord. So the threshing floor, and he builds an altar there, and it hasn't escaped him <laughs> what God is doing. He is, he's correcting him. Um, let's see. Sorry, I've got to flip this. I lost my train of mind. The, um, do you remember the, ooh, who's the guy at the other threshing floor? What was his name? I have it here. Uh, no, not Uza, the guy who owned it. His name was... Um, yeah, it was Kidon, and it, mean, it meant javelin. The man who owned this threshing floor, his name is Ornan, and it means light was perpetuated. Isn't that cool? Like, it's like the city that will never die. It'll always be there because this is where Jesus is returning to. And um, this place where God um, corrected David, I would have maybe been like, this is a painful memory. I don't want to hang out here. I really messed up. It cost a lot of people their lives. Um, it hurts. It's painful. I'm really embarrassed about this. 
let's take the Ark of the Lord. Let's go find a nicer place to do this. And David, um, he doesn't. He makes a choice that where God is correcting me, this is where I want to hang out. I'm going to build. I mean, I'm not going to build a house because God tells him that he can't, but his son is going to. So he's like, I'm going to set up the tabernacle. I'm going to get people here all the time. I, not only do I want to hang out where the Lord corrected me, but I want everybody else to know that um, um, this is where you want to hang out. You want to hang out with the Lord where he's going to, where I can come and I can adore him and he'll correct how I, my vision of him, right? I can come and I can pray for the lost and the Lord can show me, he can talk to my heart more about how lost I was and I can get a better vision of him. I can get his heart and I can come here and I can, you know, all the things that we come here to do, right? We want to, we want to adore God. We want to ask him for things. We can come here and say, God, I have no idea how I'm going to pay my bills this week. And he can, he could just pay, you know, be like, I'll pay your bills for you. And you're going to be like, great. But what he really wants is for us to say like, I'm really worried Throw me in the air so some of this worry can just go. And what's good in my faith and trust will just fall to the ground. And that's what's going to stick, right? I want less chaff in my life. I want less flesh. And I want to be more like you. And this is, I feel like, very subtle here. And maybe this is the warning that the Lord is giving us that when we do this, um, a lot, it can, I feel like two people could be doing the same thing. And it can look the same. And, and you, nobody else will be able to tell what's going on on the inside, you know? And, um, and so you're the only person inside of you. Like, Noah, you're the only person inside of you. You're the only person knowing whether, I mean, I could probably see some of the fruit of whether you're getting clean and, and have less of that chaff. But for the most part, you're the person who has to know it. And um, that we don't come here. We're not coming here out of duty. We're not coming here out of just love for each other because the Lord is coming for a pure and spotless bride. And I'm the only person that can participate with him um, in making me pure and spotless. And David, um, I guess I said some of this. In this, you know, I talked about that ladder and David on both sides. On that first threshing floor, it was like that presumption, the arrogance, really, the presumption. Um, but knowing he's with the Lord. And in this time, it was that, you know, I want to be responsible. Like, you know what I mean? I want to be responsible, but... Um, I really doubt that God is going to take care of everything. Um, you know, that doubt was his flesh. And that's, listen, it's real easy to know if your friends are doing drugs. Because <laughs> that's the flesh when you're in ninth grade. <laughs> that's what you feel like it is. But doubt is, is something that he's really talking to me about. And I think it's in James. I'm going to go to James really quick. You can come or you cannot. It's okay. Uh, is James before or after Hebrews? Hebrews, James. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Oh, I even had a thing there. Um, verse 5, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. Oh, David, I mean, can you, I always feel like there's a, in my imagination in heaven, there's a peanut gallery. And it does, it like Moses is there and David is there. And there's like all this running commentary. There's probably not, but I can just see like David, um, you know, and James, right? If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God. And David's like, uh-huh. <laughs> David, are you worried? Like, are you worried that, are you trying to make plans about your army and how you're going to protect your people? Are you worried about that? Why don't you just go ask God what he was saying about it? It actually worked for you quite a few times when you were poor and had nothing and were really scared and there was nothing you could do. But now, like, what do you feel like? I gave you some stuff and it's your job to maintain it. It's not your job to maintain it. If you're lacking wisdom, go ask God who gives to all liberally and without reproach and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith without doubting. For he who doubts is like the wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. For he's double-minded, unstable in all his ways. He's lukewarm. You know what I mean? He wants the spirit and he wants the flesh. And it's making us, it, it will make us double-minded. And we're going to be unstable. We won't be, we'll have enough of both things to not realize, you know, cold, that's hell. 
you're real cold, it's real obvious that you're going to hell, you know, at, at least for people watching here. And if you're hot, it's like, that's, that's nearness to Jesus. But lukewarm is the tragedy of outer darkness. And I don't want to be in outer darkness. I don't want my friends to be either. So we'll see. David built a place where he could go and he could meet with God because he wasn't scared of the threshing floor anymore. He knew that it was producing in him a man that was looking more and more like God, and he could feel it inside. I feel more like I'm God's man. And he's not ticked off at me. He's just really committed. God is passionately committed to, to threshing us, if we'll let him. And he's really passionate about this pure and spotless bride business. He invited, he made a place where all of his friends could come to. And, um, you know, I think of what Jesus, when he was talking to like the Pharisees and he's like, you guys won't go in and you're keeping everybody else from going in. It was the opposite of David, you know? Um, and that's not what the Lord is asking us to do. He's asking us, build a place where you want to be here all the time. Tell other people they can come here and they can be clean too. Um, Yeah, I feel like that's what the Lord said to me. Um, so I just want to pray for us. If somebody can, can you find Abriel? God, I just, um, Lord, I pray that you would, um, as we as we go into a time of prayer, God, you just show us, Lord, where um, the less obvious ways, God, where we're um, we're like the guy on the top of the ladder. And we think we have it all where we have one foot in the world. We have one foot um, in the spirit. And it just feels like so just perfect. And the truth is we can't feel anything. God, I'm praying that you would, you would show us, Lord, where any of us are afraid of that sifting God, of just of voluntarily letting our dad throw us in the air so that we can get rid of some of the chaff Lord, I just pray that that fear would go. God, would you give us vision of you like David had where he wasn't scared of what you were going to say to him. God, I pray that you would just, just come in this room right now, Lord, and talk to us. In Jesus' name.